Hi, it's Mike Shaheen with HHO Connection. I wanted to do this video today to answer some of the questions. I get emails daily from people from all over the world about HHO, and I get a lot of questions pertaining to um, installing an HHO system on a car, truck, vehicle, boat, whatever. Uh, I haven't really covered that in any videos before, uh, so I thought I would try to tackle some of the more basic questions that I get and hopefully save myself a lot of typing in response to a lot of the emails that I get. Now before I get into some of the questions, I just want to state that I'm not a mechanic. My main expertise with HHO is just in testing HHO cells. I really know a lot about HHO cells, but I don't know a whole lot about what it takes to properly install an HHO system on a car. Um, I do know a lot of people out there who have done it uh, successfully. There are some good resources out on the internet, which I'll get to at the end of this video. Uh, but for now, I'm going to go over some of the basic questions that I get and answer what I can. Thanks. Okay, one of the questions that I get asked the most is how much HHO gas do I need to put into my car in order to see positive results? So let's take a typical uh, scenario, a 5 liter engine. The rule of thumb is take half a liter per minute of HHO gas for every liter of engine size. So if you've got a 5 liter engine, then a good starting point is going to be 2.5 liters per minute of HHO gas. Now when I say starting point, um, you may want to go up a little bit or down from that. Um, some of the guys who are, do a lot of installations say a good range is a quarter to a half a liter of HHO gas for every liter of, of, of engine displacement. So with a 5 liter engine, maybe you could start at 1.25 liters and work your way up to 2.5 liters and, and see if you can make it work in that range. Now you got to be careful not to put too much gas in because that can actually give you negative results. Again, this is coming from people that I trust that have done a lot of installations and they say it is possible to put too much gas into your engine. So keep that rule of thumb in mind. Half a liter of per minute of HHO gas for every liter of engine size as a starting point. The next question that I get asked quite a bit is what size of a dry cell do I need for my car or will this particular dry cell be sufficient for my car? Let me just start by saying that I'm really conservative when it comes to dry cells as far as I'm concerned. The more steel you can afford to throw at it, the better. Uh, I've seen too many guys out there who take these little tiny cells and, and try to squeeze you know, 20, 30 amps out of them. And you can do it. You can, you know, you see these little tiny, when I say the little tiny cells, I'm, I'm thinking the little four inch cells with the circular um, gasket inside of them. That, and I've seen in, in some cases where they claim they'll do two or three liters of gas a minute. Well, yeah, technically they can do two or three liters of gas a minute, but you're gonna overdrive that cell. There's a calculation, and I'm gonna do a whole video just on that, of how to figure out how many amps you can squeeze out of a dry cell before you're gonna overdrive it. But for right now, just think of it this way. The, the, more, the bigger dry cell you can possibly throw at it, the better. Um, if you've got a five liter engine, personally, I would recommend two of the 31 plate cells where, you know, manufacturer might say good up to a six liter engine. Again, I tend to be more conservative in my opinion. Um, and again, look for my future video on how to calculate, you know, how many amps you can put in any particular cell. But uh, if you can afford a bigger cell, go for it. Um, if, a, if a cell is rated for a, for a five liter engine and you've got a two liter engine, go ahead and get it if you can afford it. You can never throw like I say, you can never throw too much steel at it. All it means is the cell is going to run cooler because it's capable of handling more amps than you're willing to throw at it. Okay, on to the next question. I get a lot of people uh, asking me about IFEs and MAP-MAF sensor controllers. Want to know what they are and, and how do they work to control the, the computer on their car. Okay, if you're brand new to this and you don't know what an IFE is, that's E-F-I-E. It stands for Electronic Fuel Injector Enhancer. And basically what it is, a little contraption, a little basically a circuit board, and it's used to control the voltage readings that are coming from the oxygen sensors on your car. All the newer cars have oxygen sensors on them. Well, I shouldn't say all of them. They either have oxygen sensors or MAP, MAF sensor controllers or both. And what they do is they, they sense the, uh, the, the levels of oxygen at different points in your, in your engine, coming from the air intake to the exhaust, and it sends these signals, depending on what the readings are, to your computer, and what that does is it's the it tells the computer how much fuel to send to your engine, depending on the oxygen levels that it's reading. 
So what the IFI does is it takes those voltage readings that are coming from the sensors and it modifies them to however you had to however you set it to either add or subtract millivolts to those those signals coming from the the sensors before it goes to the computer, which in which basically it fools the computer into thinking that you're running rich so that it sends less fuel to the to the engine, and then you're going to turn around and supplement that with the HHO so that you don't, so that you don't cause engine damage by overheating your your uh, your engine. Um, that's a whole other story though. We're not going to get into, into any details about that right now. If you've seen my other videos, I'm going to say it again. If you start playing with IFIs or MAPMAF sensor controllers, make sure that you either have or you have access to an exhaust temperature gauge because you want to monitor your exhaust temperatures because as you start leaning out the fuel to your engine, it's going to want to run hotter and hotter. And by adding the HHO, that's going to cool it down. But you want to make sure by monitoring those, those temperatures that you don't overheat your engine. Okay, so that's an IFI. The other one is a MAP-MAF sensor controller. And MAP-MAF sensor stands for MAP is M-M-A-P, mass air pressure, and MAF is M-A-F, mass airflow. That's just um, a sensor that control that, that, that senses, like, like it says, the, the pressure and the airflow going in the air intake in your car. And the MAP-MAF sensor controller does the same thing that the IFI does. It intercepts that signal coming from the MAP-MAF sensor and either adds or subtracts millivolts depending on how you have it set up in order to fool your computer into leaning out the, uh, the fuel ratio that's being sent to the engine. Okay, the next question that I get quite a bit is what is a PWM and why do I need one of those? This is a PWM right here. It stands for Pulse Width Modulator. Now what that means is with, um, the 12 volt signal that's going to your dry cell, the Pulse Width Modulator basically just pulses that signal. It's like a light switch turning it on, off, on, off very quickly at uh, what we call duty cycle. Um, different duty cycles depending on how you set it, it's going to depend on how fast that on and off is happening. If you have a 50% duty cycle, it means it's on half the time, off half the time, and so forth. So by pulsing that signal, what you're doing is you're, it allows you to control the voltage and the amperage that's going to your cell. Because without it, you're basically going to get if you're running 12 volts, you're going to get a straight 12 volt signal all the time. And what's going to happen is something called thermal runaway. As your cell heats up, it's going to want to draw more and more amperage. So it's a typical scenario. You, you come in and you start your cell up in the morning and you have your electrolyte mixed to a certain strength so that when you turn the cell on, let's say your water temperature is at 70 degrees and you're drawing 10 amps. Well, come back in 30 minutes and that cell is going to heat up quite a bit. Let's say now your temperature is up to 90 degrees or 100 degrees and you've doubled your amp draw. Now you're up to 20 amps. Well, it's going to, as time goes on, it's going to keep heating up more and more and drawing more and more amps until eventually you're going to start blowing fuses or, or your water is just going to start boiling. So that's called thermal runaway. And what the PWM, by pulsing that signal, it's, it's and turning down that duty cycle, you're turning, you're in effect turning down the voltage and it's lowering the amperage which helps to control that thermal runaway. So instead, let's say with a current limiting, this current limiting PWM here, what that means is it's going to limit that current to whatever you predetermine it to set at. So let's say instead of 10 amps, you want the cell to draw a constant 20 amps. So what you want to do is you want to mix your electrolyte even stronger so that when you start it up cold, it's automatically drawing more amps. Well, it's going to turn going to want to heat up even quicker. So by setting the PWM to 20 amps, the PWM is going to take over. As soon as that cell starts to heat up and wants to pull, wants to draw more amps, the PWM is going to take over and start pulsing that signal so that it stays at a constant 20 amps. And it'll just keep pulsing it um, more and more as needed as the cell wants to heat up. It's going to, it's going to control that cell from heating up quicker will control the thermal runaway. Now the cell will still heat up even with a, with a pulse width modulator depending on the design of your cell. The better it's designed, the less it's going to heat up. But that's the, that's the reason why you want a pulse width modulator. Now most pulse width modulators out there on the market today are current limiting like the one that I showed you here. Now there are still manu older ones or manual ones and what that means is they're going to be cheaper generally because it just means that you have to manually control it. You have to look at your amp draw through a gauge. If you see that your amps are going up too high or you're monitoring your temperature is going up too high, you have to manually take the knob and turn it down. That's the only difference between a manual 
in a current limiting PWM. But hopefully it gives you an idea of what the PWM does. Another question I get quite a bit is, what about the Volo chip? Um, can I expect to see good results with those? Now, for those who don't know, a Volo chip, it's a company named Volo. They make a little chip. It's a little blue. It's, it comes in a little plastic uh, blue encasement. And it's, it's just a tiny little circuit board that plugs into your car, it ties into your computer, and it overrides the readings that are coming off your sensors, similar to what an IFI would do, only it's more automatic. Um, I guess the company Volo, you can tell them specifically what kind of car you have, and they have some that are designed to work with HHO for your specific cars. Now, I personally have never tested a Volo chip, and so I can't vouch for whether they work or not. Everything that I've seen from people who on the forums and online who have used them, I've seen mixed results. I've seen some people say that they've had positive results of around 10% just using the Volo chips alone without HHO. I've seen some people who said they've had good results with the, with the Volo chips, anywhere from 10 to upwards of 20% uh, gains with the Volo chips. I can't verify that. Um, and I've heard other people say they've seen no gains at all and even negative results. So. Uh, do your research on the internet, maybe go to some of the forums, um, look for reviews. I, again, I can't vouch for Volo chips. I can't say whether they work or not for sure. Um, you're going to have to tackle that one on your own. One last question that I get asked a lot and it really needs to be addressed is what kind of mileage gains can I expect if I put one of these kits on my car? Um, I hate to be the Debbie Downer here, but there are no guarantees with HHO. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Uh, HHO definitely does work. It all has to do with how good you are at fooling the computer if you've got one, or how good you are at tuning your car. Uh, if you have a carbureted car, computer, whatever, it all comes down to how good of a tuner you are. Um, if you want to hold my feet to the fire and, and try to get some numbers, I'll say that um, po people who have gotten positive results with gasoline engines, uh, I would say on the low end, maybe 10%. On the high end, 20 to 30%. I would say... With big rigs, probably those same kind of numbers, lower end 10%, higher end 20 to 30%. There are stories of people who've gotten better results. Um, there's a, a friend of mine in Florida who has a, a, a bigger work type truck um, uh, with an old carbureted engine. You know, uh, I, trust, I trust him, what he says, 100%, and he says he's doubled his mileage. Now, the way he's done it, um, he's, he's, he's done his homework. He's gone and he's put stainless steel valves and and um, done some reinforcements to the engine uh, so it could handle the higher heat uh, because he's he's leaned his car engine out so much well, again he's got a carbureted engine he's gone in and rejetted the thing and he says he's gone extremely aggressive with it where he's gone and put much much smaller jets to the point where the engine barely even runs until he turns on the HHO but once he introduces the HHO he says it purrs like a kitten so there are extreme examples of people out there who I think honestly have doubled their mileage, but those are extreme cases. Again, you want to hold my feet to the fire? I would say the people who have gotten realistic positive results, probably in the low end from 10 to 30% on the high end. Well, hopefully I've been able to answer some of your more basic questions about installing an HHO system inside a vehicle. Like I said before, I'm not a mechanic, so I can't get too detailed. I can just give you the basics. There are some good uh, resources on the internet. There's two forums in particular that I want to mention. One of them is called hhoforums.com. The other one is called reduceyourfuelbill.com.au. The AU stands for Australia. That's where that site is located. Um, both of these forums have some members on there that have done quite a few installations, and they can answer some really detailed questions. There's some real heavy hitters on these forums. Now, one thing I will say, though, is before you go in there and ask questions, do your homework. Watch, watch all my videos on the basics of HHO. Um, search the threads on the forum and try to answer your questions first because these guys have to answer a lot of posts and they get tired of answering the same questions over and over again. So again, try to answer the questions first on your own before you post questions there. Now, if there are other basic questions about HHO that you think I can answer for you, please feel free to email me. My email address is mike at hhoconnection.com. Now, if you need to buy products, if you're interested in getting into HHO and you want to buy some HHO products, I do sell products on my website. I don't make them. I represent other vendors that I feel are reputable, 
and sell good products at a fair price. So I, I do ask if you are going to purchase products and I offer them for sale, I would appreciate it if you buy them off my site. The, the, the little money that I make by going through these vendors, it helps to support my HHO habit. And in doing so, I learn a lot of stuff and I'm able to, to pass it on to you through videos like this. So again, my site is HHO Connection. My name is Mike Shaheen. Uh, I hope you've learned something here. Again, if you have any more questions, feel free to email me. Take care.